Hello, fellow, and I'm the director of the Product Research and Innovation Group in the Digital Health Group. Um, I've got some slides, but we don't have to do any slides. I'll, I'll probably just show you a couple of pictures. Um, you might be surprised to sort of know that uh, I'm a social scientist by training, uh, not your typical Intel fellow in that regard, and all of the work that we do in healthcare at Intel really kind of starts with this deep understanding of real people by going out and doing social science field work. So I'll actually show you a couple photos from the field because it's illustrative of the kind of work that we do. Um, it's kind of appropriate that we're back here at Research at Intel Day. We actually were at the first Research at Intel Day in 2002. Uh, I had three people at that point. We, I had no idea if you had told me that we were going to form an entire business group focused on digital health, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, and it's, it's pretty amazing to be standing here today and have 13 health demos out there. There's a lot more that we didn't bring. There's many, many, 13 more and 13 more again that we could have brought today. Um, and we chose this year to go ahead and highlight some of the work that we've been doing in healthcare uh, because, because we're, with healthcare, as many of you know who cover healthcare, uh, the lunch buffet, we're missing the lunch buffet, uh, it often takes years of clinical trial or technology trial to prove some of the results. So uh, we're, we're making progress at starting to get some of the trial results back from some of the things that you've seen on the field and we thought it'd be a good time to share some of that. And I also think it's kind of appropriate to be here in the Computer History Museum because uh, I called this you know, distributing health from mainframe to personal health care. I went downstairs and literally saw some of the old mainframe computers, and I think it's a great metaphor for what I want to what I, what I want to talk about today. Um, everything that you're seeing on the floor is about moving towards what we call a personal health care model. Um, the lion's share of our R and D and our focus of where we're going is on how do we move healthcare from hospital to home? How do we shift expertise? Uh, and distribute that expertise that's centralized in these large urban centers often around teaching hospitals and put those technologies and that expertise out in the hands of everyday people, uh, into the hands of family members who end up doing the lion's share and create new ways for connecting the healthcare mainframe or the hospital or the clinic with the home. So we're really home focused, non-institutional settings. Um, how do you empower people to make, take better care of their own health and wellness? How do you empower family members as caregivers uh, to take care of the people that they take care of? And how do you connect clinicians, physicians and nurses in some new ways with people and collect data in a real world, real time environment as opposed to bring them to a hospital or a clinic for a 15 minute exam and then you make all of these you know, life and death decisions based on that 15 minute exam and send them home again and hope that it all works. I mean, that's, that's the big challenge. I'll start with a, a picture of a healthcare mainframe. Um, this is Oregon Health and Science University Hospital Complex in Portland, Oregon, where I live. Uh, I'm often treated here as a patient in some of my own health care issues. Um, and if you think about it, that is the medical mainframe, right? And this is a, how we often do health care today in many parts of the world. We build this uh, enormous complex. We house tons of experts and surgeons and uh, expert physicians there. We put multi-million dollar miraculous MRI machines and technologies there. And we timeshare this, right? Much like we timeshare mainframe computers decades ago. And what I want to suggest to you is we are at a point in time, both in terms of technology's history, as well as a point in time in terms of demographics and, f and economics, where we need to see the transformation of healthcare from these big, expensive mainframe systems to a personalized model, where these technologies are out in the home, on our bodies, and on our cell phones, and out in the world. And that's almost all the experimentation and all the clinical trials that we're doing are, are with that vision in mind. Now I'm not saying the hospital is going to go away, I'm not saying that they're not important, I'm saying there's more to life and there's more to health and wellness than waiting until you're enormously ill, sending you to this medical mainframe and pumping you full of miraculous technologies and drugs to try to bring you back from recovery. If we don't take early detection, prevention, family caregiving and the other aspects of health and wellness seriously, we're going to be in a whole serious lot of trouble uh, internationally. Our, latest government report as they've tallied up the health care bill in the United States from two years ago. It takes them two years to tally the tally the bills at 1.9 trillion, right? So this mainframe health care model in the United States cost us 1.9 trillion today, more than 15 percent of our GDP. The latest estimates suggest over the next 15 years it's going to go to four trillion dollars or almost a quarter of our GDP. Now we already know that 50 million Americans cannot afford access to this health care mainframe. They're not allowed to timeshare this system because they don't have health insurance and another 20 million are underinsured, right? So this model, which 
does amazing things of bringing people back to life, right? Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, we can't afford to pay for it today. And we're about to double or triple the number of the most expensive people coming into the system, elderly people, right? And so if you just look at those numbers, 600 million 60-year-olds on the planet in 2002 worldwide. 600 million. By 2025, so 17 more years from now, those numbers double to 1.2 billion 60 and above. And then by 2050, we top 2 billion people over the age of 60 on the planet. So you can't pay for the medical mainframe today, and we're about to double and in many countries triple the number of older people who are the most expensive to care for. Business as usual is not, is not an option. So our big research question at Intel is not how do we just make that medical mainframe more efficient? And we certainly want electronic health records and we want to do all the things we can to make doctors and nurses more efficient. But at the end of the day, if we don't change how we do healthcare and take prevention and early detection and caregiving and those kinds of things seriously, we're in a whole heap of trouble. And this is an enormous uh, opportunity for the growth of information technologies, right? This is none of what you're seeing on the floor is funded by the Intel Charitable Foundation. It is funded by parts of Intel that are already a business, the Digital Health Group, as well as the Corporate Technology Group, the Solution Software Group, because we believe this is an enormous business opportunity for Intel as we go forward uh, uh, on, on making some of these things. I said that we wanted to focus more on the home and the hospital. Um, I also mentioned to you that our approach is to start with field work. As I said, I'm a social scientist. We have the largest team of social scientists in the technology industry, a mix of psychologists, uh, communication scholars like myself, nurses, physicians, medical anthropologists who go out and study the world of people. And you might ask, why do we do this? You know, most of Silicon Valley and most of technology companies are younger people who have not had any exposure to things like Alzheimer's. And when you take engineers into a house of a, in this case, a 60-year-old man, uh, or uh, no, actually this is, this is Carl, I know who this is, actually he was 85, but we've seen people at, at age 60 and 50 with Alzheimer's. And you have to have a notebook next to his bed because he gets up in the morning and can't remember that he's 85. And, you know, they have to leave him this note, and this one's kind of funny, right? No, you don't need to go to work. You have been retired for 25 years. You worked at Toledo Edison. You were at the water department, right? That's a wake-up call to a young engineer who's never, have, never had a healthcare care problem in their lives. So just the field work exposes you to life experiences and to problems that we would never get by sort of sitting in a lab or doing a survey, right? And it becomes very real. That one's kind of funny. It's a little bit more disturbing when you see books like this, right? You have to remind them that he was married for 68 years to Phyllis. Um, you know, God took her away from us on November 17, 2002. You are at her side. You will miss her, right? These people can't remember that their spouse has died. They can't differentiate the difference between a stranger knocking at their front door and someone that they've been married to for 50 years, right? Understanding those problems means all these great technologies that you see out here are, for me, it's like a kid in a candy store, right? Because we've got these miraculous technologies that may never see the light of day, and I'm going to match make those cool technologies with the problems and the realities that we see appear, people experiencing in healthcare out in the world. And almost every study that we do kind of starts with this grounding in the lived experience.